set on and leave no ceremony out. Caesar, ah, who calls? Bid every noise be still, peace yet again. Who is it in the press that calls on me? I hear a tongue, shriveler than all the music. Cry, Caesar, speak. Caesar is turned to hear. Beware the Ides of March. What man is that? A soothsayer bids you beware the Ides of March. Well, set him before me. Let me see his face. Fellow, come from the throng. Look upon Caesar. What sayest thou to me now? Speak you once again. Beware the Ides of March. He is a dreamer. <laughs> Let him pass. Citizens, I beg your pardon. I know I can get carried away, and particularly at this time, the Ides of March. Welcome back to Al Monticello, and particularly to a subject very dear to my heart. I've grown up with it, and uh, I will carry its inspiration to the grave. I'm very much looking forward to your questions today. And well, we have Miss Melanie Boyer who's here to speak with us and to uh, ask us uh, questions. And uh, well, I look forward to whatever is on your mind upon this wonderful subject, Shakespeare. <laughs> well, Melanie, what is our first question for today? Thank you, Mr. Jefferson. When and where do you remember seeing your first Shakespeare play and what was it? I recall that my first Shakespeare play that I saw was The Merchant of Venice and uh, it was in Petersburg. I was a very young man. I went to see the presentation with my good friend Johnny Page. In fact, I wrote to him and said, uh, when can we off to Petersburg in order to see uh, Mr. Douglas' company, the old American company of players, David Douglas. Uh, he later came to, well, perform in Williamsburg, and I saw many more Shakespeare plays there, along with many other plays. But of course, I grew up with Shakespeare. And as I say that, uh, I'm holding before you my commonplace book. A commonplace book is what um, is what you create as a young student, uh, and whatever you may be reading that affects you in either heart or mind, you enter it into your commonplace. You commonplace it. So I had many entries of what uh, I delighted to read in the works of William Shakespeare, and coincidentally, my father, Colonel Peter Jefferson. Uh, had a collection of Shakespeare's play at Sh plays at Shadwell, where I was born and grew up. In fact, um, Julius Caesar was part of the collection, as well as what is known as the Tetralogy. Uh, that is uh, Richard II, Henry IV, uh, parts one and two, and a favorite of mine, Henry V. So Shakespeare has been with me from my youth. Your next question. So theater is usually a community event. Did you attend the theater or read plays with others? I certainly did, without a question. Consider, I grew up in the wilderness. I still consider myself to be a savage of the forest. And so who did we have but one and the other to enjoy and entertain? And reading Shakespeare and plays and the poems of Milton it was something that occupied our time delightfully. In fact, my good friend from youth, Dabney Carr, Dabney Carr and I would come up here to the mountaintop. We'd sit under an old oak tree on the southwest side and we would engage our, our studies, our schoolwork, and particularly read Shakespeare and poems to one and the other. That is where we made our pact that the first who would die would be buried underneath that oak tree by the other. I think you know that story. Dabney married my sister, Martha. They had several children. We both attended to public service together, the age of 26, to be seated in the old house of Burgesses in Williamsburg. I never thought that would be the beginning of 40 years in public service, any more than Dabney realized, nor myself, in four years. Dabney would pass away at the early age of 30. And to fulfill our pact, he was buried under that oak tree. That in itself 
is almost Shakespearean, is it not? And frankly, if you will allow me to ramble just a bit further, one of my favorite of Shakespeare's sonnets, he writes upwards of 150, is, is the one numbered 18. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Many people think of it as a, a sonnet to affairs de amor, but there's another way to look at it, a sonnet perhaps to a, a dear loved one passed away whose memory will continue through eternity. <laughs> yes, I attended to the theater several times with my good friends uh, when I was courting Mrs. Jefferson in Williamsburg, Virginia. I entered it into my memorandum book, uh, attending the theater nearly every night for two weeks. What a pleasure it was to, to see there again David Douglas's company, the old American company in the old theater in Williamsburg. It stood near Mrs. Campbell's uh, and the old Capitol building. Oh, I remember there were three particular tickets one could purchase. Uh, for seven shillings, you could be seated in a box. Oh, that was the highest, uh, the most comfortable, rest you assured. Uh, whomever you were courting, that was the ticket you would purchase. Uh, then there was five shillings, which meant in the pit. And, and literally the pit, you, you stood on the ground floor of the theater. There were no seats. And then for three shillings, well, the gallery. And that meant up there, high above Oh, and they were a rowdy lot, but no less, I may tell you, the pit. Oh, they could hurl aspersions, whatever they chose to say to the actors while the performance was continuing. They were happy days. I loved the theater. In fact, I will tell you one of the first occasions I recall enjoying the company of General Washington uh, was at the theater uh, in Williamsburg. It was about um, 17 and 68. He was there with several friends and, and I was there as well. That was quite the society when we would all gather during the, the court season in the autumn uh, or the spring, uh, let alone the sessions of the old House of Burgesses. Uh, many of us who argued and debated politics on the floor during the day would attend to the taverns and the inns and the theater in the evening. Next question. So we have a question from a viewer asking if enslaved people got to attend plays or performances of Shakespeare. Oh, that is a very good uh, question. I can tell you that as many of our, our serving men would accompany us, our man servants, mine in particular, Jupiter, who accompanied me to Williamsburg often, uh, would indeed, whether I knew it or not, be able to get, get a glimpse of one of the performances and the plays. And when you figure in a four mile an hour world that uh, we are spending five days to cover 120 miles both to and from Williamsburg, well, yes, uh, a conversation upon the pleasantries uh, in Williamsburg, uh, upon the, the plays and performances that, uh, that I was able to see uh, often uh, came into discussion. I can't remember precisely what we would talk about, but if you're asking, uh, did enslaved have a knowledge of Shakespeare? Well, yes, of course. And it might be the further interesting to you to realize that, as you know, uh, our Hemings family here uh, came to me through the estate of my father-in-law, uh, the late John Wales, after I married Mrs. Martha Wales Skelton, a widow at the time. Well, it may be interesting to know that Bette Hemings, the mother of that family, uh, was the daughter of an English sea captain by the name of Hemings. Now then, uh, of the very well-known actors in uh, the King's Company, those uh, that performed with William Shakespeare himself at the Old Globe Theater, were three very prominent actors. Henry Condell, one, Richard Burbage, the other, and John Hemmings. John Hemmings had a very large family from what I have heard, uh, upwards of nearly 14 children. Several of them became mariners. And it is known that they sailed to the island of Jamaica and that at least one or two took up habitation there. 
So who is to say there could very well be a, a connection? And furthermore, one of my favorite of Shakespeare's plays is Othello, or The Moor of Venice. Now, one could take that play in many different ways as to its understanding and its meaning. Its meaning, of course, in many ways is relevant to, to race. The fact that Desdemona is considered a very pure white maiden and marries, if you will, a, a dark Moorish uh, general uh, can cause some discomfort in the theater, and Shakespeare meant it to cause discomfort as he got across, if you will, the emotion and the recognition of the valor, the valor of Otello himself as a successful general and done in by those who were jealous of him. So yes, I think this subject is, is quite relevant in, in the discussion of Shakespeare and his effect upon the world during his day and as it continues. The next question. So Brendan asked if you if there were theaters in Washington D.C. when you were in the president's house, or if you maybe if you attended some even earlier in Philadelphia during the years of the Continental Congress. Well, I can tell you this, Brenda. For all of the theater that we enjoyed here in Virginia, whether it be in Petersburg or Fredericksburg or Williamsburg, we soon discovered that when we were appointed delegates to the Continental Congress in Philadelphia, though I missed the first Congress, that convened in September of 74, as I attended the second in 75, Brenda, the Continental Congress shut down the theaters. We did not attend any plays or soirees of that kind. No, we had not the opportunity to enjoy these plays and these productions, particularly presentations of Shakespeare, until after uh, the war was over. I, I believe they began to reconvene in Philadelphia about 1785. Unfortunately, I was not there at the time. I was in France, and rest assured, Brenda, I had more than ample opportunity to delight in plays and theatrical uh, productions. But uh, as you ask about Washington City, yes, there was um, the John Street Playhouse that opened in Washington City uh, that I had the opportunity to attend uh, uh, several times during my two administrations there. So I, I doubt anyone who is engaged in politics could, <laughs> could underestimate the effect of theater has upon their lives, uh, particularly Shakespeare and his magnificent speeches, that is one of the things that so pleases me about Shakespeare, uh, is the influence it has upon speech making and moving the heart and moving the conscience. <laughs> Believe me, give me liberty or give me death may not have been precisely Shakespeare. No, it was out of the play Cato written by Addison, Joseph Addison, but how will we ever forget that it was Patrick Henry who moved so many in that speech that ended, give me liberty or give me death, when he was merely reciting lines from a play. So we have an interesting question here from Bridget. She would like to know if you think Shakespeare's plays are good for the education of women. Oh. Bridget, they certainly are. In fact, I can tell you, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the gentleman. Uh, he wrote me a, a letter about my opinion upon the education of women, and I began in the first paragraph to apologize that I had never given it any systematic thought. Now, I continued to suggest in a curriculum that might be offered to the enlightenment uh, of our women folk. Uh, that, yes, there should be knowledge and curriculum in literature. However, uh, I did express a disdain for sensational novelettes. Uh, I think they can do a disservice to, uh, to the morality, if you will, and sense of morale of a young lady. However, Shakespeare, indeed, I recommend it amongst the poets first and foremost, let alone Milton. And my, my grandchildren, particularly my granddaughters, uh, have always been so happy to receive not only their first Lego hat, 
not only to receive their first pair of dainty gloves, but also to receive their first volumes of Shakespeare from me. So Mr. Jefferson, you mentioned that you were in France for five years. Um, while you were there, you visited England and toured through the English countryside with Mr. and Mrs. John Adams. Did you see any of Shakespeare's plays while you were there? We certainly did. And I say we, uh, because when I had the opportunity to sail to France, it was, let me see, uh, excuse me, sail from France to England. It was during the months of, uh, of March and April. It was in 1786. The purpose was to meet up with John and Abigail Adams uh, and along with several other ambassadors of European kingdoms, we might all have the opportunity to tend to uh, well, treaties of trade and the like. Unfortunately, mm. the British monarchy understood that that would be my purpose coming over from France and to ally with the Adams. So they did everything they possibly could to keep us apart from those occasions of business. Well, happily enough, we filled them by going to the theater. And absolutely, one of my favorite memories of attending the theater was the Theater Royal Drury Lane and having the opportunity to witness Mrs. Sarah Siddons. My heavens. Her roles, that of Lady Macbeth, let alone that of Portia in The Merchant of Venice, I shall never forget. She was but about 30, 31 years of age, and she was riveting. Absolutely riveting. Uh, you know, she was a Kemble. Uh, her husband, John Kemble, uh, an actor as well and, and theater manager. And uh, he had a daughter uh, by the name of Fanny Kemble, who has followed through with the profession. And they are an extraordinary uh, acting family. And I have heard of late that there is a very fine rendering, that is a painting of Sarah Siddons as Lady Macbeth, you would hardly think that the rendering of her in pure white, they tell me, also exudes a sense of chicanery. I shall leave it at that. But yes, I spent many a happy evening in the theater while Mr. and Mrs. Adams and I uh, would attend during our, our weeks there in London. So when you were on your journeys there, did you visit the birthplace of William Shakespeare oh. at Stratford-upon-Avon? <laughs> we certainly did visit Stratford-upon-Avon. We would not have missed it on our journeys through the Midlands uh, of England. Oh, my heavens. I, well, let me just say this. Mrs. Adams would tell you no sooner did our carriage uh, come into the very center of Stratford-upon-Avon. It might have been the Market Square. Uh, she will tell you that I was the first to alight from the carriage. I knelt down and kissed the ground. <laughs> she will also tell you that her husband was not so um, emotionally driven. And uh, the Adams and I visited the house where it is said William Shakespeare was born. Uh, lamentably, the house where he died, his beautiful house that he had built himself, uh, has been demolished and, and torn down. But they did have the chair, it was said, William Shakespeare last sat in before he died. That chair was there in the house in which he was born. Oh, I think it, uh, it cost us, what, about a, a shilling to be able to go into the house to see where he was born, let alone a shilling even to see the chair in which he sat. Well, John Adams and I would not pay that money without pursuing another opportunity uh, when the, the guide, if you will, the docent, left the room. This is just between us citizens. Both Mr. Adams and I cut a piece of wood from the chair in which William Shakespeare last sat. It is a venerable relic within our families. I should say no more. But I will tell you this, which is rather fascinating upon the subject. When the Adams and I visited the cathedral, where it is said William Shakespeare was buried, well, you know, there's a remarkable tombstone that has upon it inscribed 
uh, good friend for Jesus' sake, forbear to dig the dust and close it here. Uh, I'd leave it up to you to pursue it even further, but it's, it's, it's a warning, almost, if you will. It's, it's a kind of curse. It says, cursed be he that moves these bones. Uh, and yet, why does it not have, if it's ascribed to be the tombstone upon the remains of William Shakespeare, why does it not have his name? let alone the years of his birth and death. Well, do you know Mr. Adams says he does not believe that William Shakespeare was buried there. He believes that that stone simply is wont to signify a great number of bones uh, for whom there is no further identity. Uh, and they've all been collected in some sort of great ossuary. And this the stone applied on top of it. And there was rather, as I recall, and Mr. Adams felt the same way, a rudely carved bust of Mr. Shakespeare, they say, was placed there by his daughter. Those are my memories, but, oh, good heavens, who could ever not travel through the Midlands of England, let alone to go to England alone, without visiting the birthplace of the great bard. You know, as I recited earlier, if you will, uh, Julius Caesar, I often wonder what must William Shakespeare have been reading when he was a young boy and growing up. And his father, to think, John Shakespeare, was a lover. <laughs> um, beg your pardon, I ramble. Uh, the next question. Well, that's actually kind of relevant to a question from Camille. She asks, what lessons can be learned from Shakespeare's Julius Caesar? <sighs> Camille, that is such a wonderful question. Do you know why? One might immediately assume the lesson to be learned from Julius Caesar is the lesson, lesson of ambition, far too much ambition. And what will happen that an individual seeking so much in that regard shall fail and fall? Well, you know, there's another side to Julius Caesar. It is what can happen when we have achieved a government at such a great point, a republic, if you will, as Caesar was bringing in, and then suddenly forget what has been achieved with so much bloodshed and so much work that one individual, one individual what, by pure jealousy and nothing more, ought to be relieved of his power? Is that not perhaps why, friends, neighbors, countrymen, lend me your ear. I will only say this, it has several sides to it, as I referred earlier to the play Otello. I think the reader and one who sees the play ought to judge for themselves. It is a magnificent work about the contentions amongst men in forming their government. And would that it could have within it, if you will, a call, a rallying call, as I believe Henry V has in the St. Crispin's Day speech, that we could realize what a happy band of brothers can create and, and seek to maintain without seeking to destroy. <laughs> That's my opinion about Julius Caesar. I... Yes, your next question. So a viewer asks about the importance of a classical education, including Shakespeare, on the enlightenment of society and the survival of a democratic republic? Well, thank you for that question. I think I just referred to it with respect, of course, to Henry V and the rallying call that Prince Hal is wont to provide there on the eve of the Battle of Algen Court when they're vastly outnumbered, or the reading of Shakespeare that helps us to better understand, if you will, uh, how power can easily be corrupted or question how has it been corrupted or what can be done to maintain good and virtuous government? I think it's very, very necessary. This is one of the reasons why I kept my commonplace book from the years of my youth. And if you would allow, maybe one or two recitations here uh, might, be, um, might be enjoyable. Uh, in my commonplace book, uh, I have here, if you will, a line from Julius Caesar. Very relevant. Cowards may die many times before their deaths. The valiant never taste of death but once. 
truly those who are looked upon by exemplar, as exemplary leaders by the people themselves are valiant individuals. And when you speak of enlightenment, do we not speak of the enlightening of the mind of man through the swift and uh, influential process of communication? You know, I cannot help but think back uh, when I was in France, had the opportunity to go to the south of France, if you will, uh, to enjoy the troubadours who would make their way and their journeys to entertain in some of the inns, the ordinaries, and to listen to their songs and their poetry very much upon historical themes and to realize how many, how many people, so many people for centuries were actually learning history, even if they could not read through the medium, if I may refer to it, of music and plays. Do you know Shakespeare is nonetheless, and I am thinking distinctly of so much that Shakespeare wrote and made up with respect to the English language. I know of very few poets, Milton perhaps included, other than Shakespeare, who give us such a wonderful extent of the full force and variety and extent of the English language, its beauty and its application, and how with a knowledge of it and a sense of it applied to the heart and particularly morality, that we can make up words applicable to it. It's herein is what I have written from my youth. Phrases, if you will, that we are wont to use nearly every day and hardly realize they originate in Shakespeare. It's Greek to me, and Shakespeare. It's vanished into thin air. <laughs> oh, it's too much of a good thing. I refuse to budge an inch. Oh, I slept not a wink. This afternoon, I can tell you this, I have not been tongue-tied. <laughs> I suspect foul play. We just spoke of Macbeth not too long ago. And then there, of course, is uh, Coriolanus. So oh, we could go on with foul play. It involves your own flesh and blood. I've been hoodwinked. I've been given short shift. Recalling my salad days, the devil incarnate, a laughing stock, a blinking idiot, and an eyesore. Shakespeare, is it not beautiful? And as it flows trippingly upon the tongue, is it not like a hip hop, if you will, a rapping sound, if you will, of all of it coming at you at once, lifting the spirit, engaging you in the emotions of the heart, a regard for your fellow man, a caution as well, and hope for the future. That is enlightenment. That is what language provides us, particularly Shakespeare in his time and through time. <laughs> Beg your pardon, I, I got a bit carried away there theatrically. Well, let's end on um, this question then. Bess asks whether you have a favorite among Shakespeare's comedies or maybe even his plays. Could you talk about your favorite? Beth, I have mentioned that I, I first read Julius Caesar as a young boy. I read him today in, in recognition, if you will, of um, the Ides of March, the feast of Anna Perennia, the Roman goddess of the year. How appropriate in recognition of the ladies. I had mentioned that I delighted in the performance of Macbeth, Saracens, the Merchant of Venice in kind that a favorite of mine remains Henry V. How uplifting indeed. Romeo and Juliet is no less a delight for me. Uh, all's well that ends well, a pleasure, Midsummer Night's Dream. Oh yes, indeed, comedies therein. In fact, when I was in London, I made sure that I would not return here home without purchasing at least two renditions uh, of, of prints of the well-known um, Bordel, Boydell uh, family. I'm pronouncing it wrong. I'm forgetting. It was John and Josiah, and they had 100 beautiful paintings of scenes out of Shakespeare. I just wish to acquire prints of these scenes 
and was able to acquire two. I still have them here at Monticello. I hope you will come visit and see them. Uh, a very fine Bordell, Bordell print of um, Taming of the Shrew and one as well, A Midsummer Night's Dream. I wish that I could have had a portrait of William Shakespeare. I even asked John Trumbull if one might be had because as you know, I have portraits of Locke, Newton, and Bacon, America's Vespucci, and Columbus, but Shakespeare, unfortunately, uh, there appears to be only one that is assumed to be valid uh, at the Chandros uh, House family, Marleybone, uh, one that could have been painted by one of his actors. Uh, others are questionable, and the print of that portrait of William Shakespeare is the one that appears in the first folio of of 16 and 23, but I meander, I wander, and that is because I'm wondering here, in answer to your question, and perhaps, if you will, somewhat of a finale of our gathering, that I might read to you a passage out of two of my favorite plays. The first one, as I have referred to Shakespeare, inspiring morality and a moral spirit, is a passage out of Henry VIII. It is, if you will, in Act Three. Cardinal Wolsey is speaking to Thomas Cromwell. Cromwell, I charge thee, fling away ambition. By that sin fell the angels. How can man then, the image of his maker, hope to win by it? Love thyself last. Cherish those hearts that hate thee. Corruption wins not more than honesty. Still, in thy right hand carry gentle peace to silence envious tongues. Be just, fear not. Let all the ends thou aimest at be thy country's, thy God's, and truth's. And finally, Henry V, that marvelous St. Crispin's Day speech. I referred to it earlier. The British, outnumbered by the French, there upon the fields of Agincourt. How will Henry rally the few that are there? Oh, Westmoreland cares not to stay. He will leave to save his own life. And so not the entire speech, but these few lines and amended with a few lines that are nonetheless rallying for all of us, all of us as Americans. I mean this female as well as male. I mean all of us who have been here already on this continent for centuries. Those who are brought here against their will. Those of us who continue to settle the West and the younger generations come up. We cannot forget our founding principles. We have to continue to rally for the generations yet born for a more equal and exact justice and for a more perfect union. To wit, if you will, the suggestion of Henry, of Henry V. This story shall the good man teach his son and Crispin Crispians ne'er go by from this day to the end of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And in support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of the divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. No less Shakespearean. Thank you. I look forward for our next time together. And I remain your humble and obedient servant. Thank you, Melanie. And thank you all. Good day.